center opening uh, these days. So uh, I'm from Ulm University, but also uh, from a Center for Integrated Quantum Science and Technology. Uh, so we also have a, a center which uh, uh, bring together scientists from different fields uh, interested in quantum physics and quantum information. In our case, it's electrical engineering, chemistry, mathematics, um, physics, but also even now biology. So we have also pretty large school, but we don't have philosophers. So this is some unique uh, feature of uh, Jerusalem. And uh, so the talk will be today about uh, solid state system and solid state qubits and about the applications of our small number of qubits in a solid state and the qubits will be dopants in diamond. So in diamond like you see on this picture here. Uh, this is, uh, was taken just after uh, irradiation of number of diamonds by electrons. We tried to create these color centers and you see there's a bunch of colors. Uh, so different color centers. Actually after this irradiation we milled these diamonds to a very small particles and I'm also going to talk a bit about diamond nanoparticles and sensors. But as a motivation slide, I just would like maybe continue the story of uh, NMR uh, and quantum information. NMR is a very successful technology, as you've heard yesterday. Uh, first Schroer algorithm demonstration and also first error correction was done in NMR. Um, and then there is uh, one point in NMR which provoked some discussions long time ago. It's uh, preparation of the initial state. So, in uh, NMR, you usually work with so-called pseudo-pure state. So you work in liquid state in reasonable fields. A few Tesla and polarization of nuclei is not 100%. So you can also translate it in the fidelity of gate, as we discussed uh, or was discussed yesterday, or in the initialization errors. And uh, you can start to think about whether you can do better job. So you can go to higher magnetic fields, essentially, uh, what is matter is separation between nuclear uh, spin sublevels compared to, uh, to KT. And uh, you can either uh, still in a reasonable field 20 Tesla, like in this NMR spectrometer, and then you can calculate the temperature you need to cool down the nuclei, and it will be about like uh, 20 to 40 millikelvin. And uh, that is hard to combine with a, with a liquid state in NMR, but maybe in solid states, right? So there is uh, there's maybe a way to do it. If you you uh, remain in a liquid state and want to s uh, say that you want to be at room temperatures, then you need a field of 150,000 Tesla, which is difficult to realize. So there is um, a bit of uh, uh, experimental challenge here. And uh, there is also a way, uh, uh, very interesting way to cool the nuclear spins uh, by algorithmic cooling and the wear demonstration also that uh, I'm not going to, to talk about this. You had uh, introductions and uh, I think there, there is a way actually to, to push this, uh, these borders here using uh, novel quantum information inspired techniques to control nuclear spins. But uh, today I'm going to talk about a bit different situation where you have only one nuclear spin. And if you have only one, one nuclear spin, then the spin will be either spin up or spin down. If you can measure it, you can polarize it by measurement. Then all these constraints related to fields and temperatures are not anymore valid. So actually this was uh, realized quite a long time ago by pioneers in quantum information. Here is a citation of, uh, of the uh, one of the first liquid state NMR quantum information paper. And uh, what they say is that, uh, well, a single state is, is, is a good approach, single nuclear spin NMR is a good approach, but it's very difficult to realize because of the high sensitivity required to see the small magnetic induction signal created by a single nuclei. Uh, so this is uh, fully true, so, but uh, you have to, to, to read it carefully. So they say induction signal. So induction signal is what you usually use in NMR. Put a coil close to the sample and, and measure induction. So this is not very sensitive. Uh, but there are other techniques not based on induction. So here's some overview. Uh, you can think about measure forces. So forces induced on magnetic cantilever uh, by a single nuclear spin. So this a technique called magnetic resonance force microscopy and it was uh, introduced recently and reached nowadays uh, sensitivity of about um, 1,000 nuclear spins or maybe in a, in a special resolution about 40 cubic nanometers. 
there is electrical detection where you make your current in uh, semiconductor nanostructures somehow uh, sensitive to the state of the nuclear spin inside of a uh, small uh, current channel. And there is a technique uh, based on the optical detection of our electron and nuclear spins. So single uh, spin enabled by optical detection technique. And this, this is a technique I'm going to talk about today. So let me again uh, pose the problem uh, of sensitivity in other words. So what is actually, what is the problem in ESR and NMR? Actually, the difficulty is that uh, the transition is very low energy. For ESR, electron spin resonance is about 10 to the minus 5 electron volt. For nuclear spin, it's 10 to the minus 8 electron volt. Yeah, so in electron volt energy scale. In this uh, domain, there is no very good photon detectors, and also spontaneous emission rate is very low. So uh, if you want to just uh, uh, watch the spontaneous emission on, on an NMR machine, uh, so that's not very sensitive. Uh, so same true for APR. However, if you now uh, uh, create another readout channel by linking the uh, magnetic resonance spin transition to some <coughs> optical channel, so imagine that you have three level atom with some ground state having a spin and uh, excited state connected to only one of the spin sublevel by selective optical transition. Then you can count optical photons, this is uh, about two EV photons, and there we have very good detectors, so we can do it very efficiently. And uh, the technique was introduced already a long time ago. In '52, there was first uh, demonstration of enhancement on sensitivity for spin resonance using optical techniques. So basically looking on a uh, number of scattered photons uh, in mercury vapors. Uh, connection now, transition to a single spin is very simple. Now we can uh, think about now combining this with uh, confocal microscopy. We focus the laser light uh, in, in on a sample where there is only one such optically active spin sitting in a laser focus. Yeah. So you can also start to think about what kind of material you need or what a priority. You need to make sure that only one spin sits here. And if you have a condensed matter, there are billions of so solid state atoms uh, present in a laser focus. So the material have to be very, very clean and very well controlled. So the, uh, you have to be able to place individual optically active center, like uh, this one. Uh, and all the other atoms in the solid state have to be inert. They will serve just like a kind of trap or holder for this atom. So that's put some requirements on material science. And not many materials can be engineered in such a way that there is only one impurity atom in a laser focus. Okay. Um, so maybe silicon. Uh, but silicon has a pretty low band gap. So there is not so much uh, uh, optical transitions of color centers invisible or diamond. So diamond can be engineered nowadays by, uh, uh, by a way that allowed to control the material property in a very good manner. So the, uh, we are currently using synthetic diamonds mostly <coughs> because natural diamonds are not pure enough. And diamonds can be uh, s uh, grown uh, in, in plasma uh, containing methane and hydrogen. So this is a, a photo of reactor where very pure diamonds can be created. So you see here some plasma ball. And uh, from methane we deposit, or our colleagues deposit atoms by atoms uh, uh, carbon in a diamond phase. That takes about a few hours uh, to grow about 100 micrometer thick layer. If you run the machine for a few days, you get such a crystal. So dimensions here are 4 per 4 millimeters. And the thickness is about half of half of millimeter. Yeah, the concentration of impurity in such a material is on the order of 10 to the 12 per cubic centimeter. And uh, that's exactly a uh, concentration which allow you to have no single impurity atom in a micrometer cube volume. Uh, at this point, uh, the, you can start to think about bringing these color centers one by one in a diamond lattice or bringing these artificial spins or uh, engineer spins one by one in a diamond lattice, so if you have such a purity of material. I have to say also that uh, diamond can be uh, made uh, spin free because most of the carbon isotope is C12, but there is 1% of carbon 13, which have nuclear spin half. 
And uh, uh, if you take uh, your chemicals enriched in C12, you can grow a uh, very pure 99.99% C12 diamond, which are completely nuclear spin free. So you can engineer lattice which don't have any spins, neither electrons or nuclear spins. And uh, that's very important for coherence time of this engineered spin inside of solids. I'm going to talk a little bit more in a few slides. Now, this artificially engineered spins, which, are, which have optical transitions, are called color centers, and they are about 500 in diamonds. So I'm going to talk more uh, mostly about nitrogen vacancy color center, and this is uh, the structure of these color centers and the energy level scheme. So the structure is pretty simple. So this is diamond lattice, where one of the carbon atoms is replaced by nitrogen, and there is a vacancy nearby. So in total, the system has six electron spins, so it's like an artificial molecule in diamond, and the ground state of these uh, six electron molecules is a spin triplet. So here, three, <coughs> three states with different magnetic quantum number. Excited state is also spin triplet, and there are a few singlet metastable states. So um, shining the laser light, so connecting this ground state and excited state optical transitions, uh, via optical excitation, uh, bring the system spin selectively in a singlet state, so shelf the population, and the singlet state always decay in one particular magnetic sublevel of the ground state, resulting in a very high polarization of the spin state, even at room temperature. So it's enough to, uh, to shine a milliwatt laser on a diamond sample, and after a few microseconds, you get all your electron spins polarized uh, by 96%, so basically a micro-Kelvin efficient spin temperature, even though the diamond lattice remain at room temperature. Yeah, so you can selectively polarize spins, and those are very much isolated from environment. Yes? Is the origin of the missing 4%? Um, it's the selectivity of this branching. So, uh, and uh, actually this is a so very important question. So. Um, in some se so the selectivity of the branching depends on the strain on the crystal and a few parameters. It was shown that in some, co in some very good diamonds, this can be 99%, but 96% is a typical. <coughs> now, the, um, one of the states which is actually polarized uh, when you shine a laser light is cycling more photons. One of the transition <coughs> connecting uh, MS equals zero of the ground state and excited state is long cycling transition, and the other, tr and the, uh, the other spin state are shelved in a metastable state and non radiate too much photons. That means by counting the number of photons, we can also say in which spin state the, uh, the color center is, and that provides uh, a mechanism for optical contrast for magnetic resonance. So exactly this uh, optical channel for readout we were discussing before. So just will show you an uh, uh, example how the uh, magnetic resonance signal looks like. But for most of experiments now, we can forget about this, all these other energy levels. Just remember that this state now, which is usually polarized, is brighter. If you count the number of photons, there is more scattered photons than in two other spin sublevels. Yeah? So the, when by counting number of scattered photons, we can say in which state the center is. So the, the, the NV centers also absorb strongly so, and emit a lot of photons in the sense that you even can see individuals. So this picture is from diamond having many NV centers, but not so many actually, about one ppm concentration. One, carbon atom, one out of million carbon atoms now is replaced by NV center and you see strong color. Yeah, that means that uh, absorption cross-section is high. So maybe so compared to atomic systems, the same strength of transition as in rubidium. So, and uh, if we now dilute the, the color centers, take the sample with much less color centers or engineer them one by one, well, we can get a picture where in a CCD camera we can see individual spots corresponding to individual atoms, individual spins. So this is exactly how it looks like. Let's also show the sketch of typical experiment. So we have our uh, diamond piece, which we image on a CCD. This is real CCD image of a diamond having array of implanted in V centers. Every spot here is an uh, individual defect. So we have our microscope objective lens where we, s we focus laser down to this 300 nanometers. We, we have a 
green laser usually in experiments exactly is the same as in this laser pointer or very similar and uh, quite sensitive detector to see the scattered light, the red scattered light from a single color centers. So you usually, uh, before we start experiment, check whether the single spots are individual defects by measuring second order correlation function of emitted light. So we see that the uh, G2 function go to zero for individual quantum emitters, so that we always check before we start experiment. And uh, for exciting the, uh, the spin transition, we just put some wire. So it's actually, uh, it's a charm of single spin ESR and NMR experiments that you don't need uh, very homogeneous fields. So if you do ensemble to get a high fidelity gates, usually you have to make sure that your field is very homogeneous. Yeah? Or you have to do some efforts in, in, in optimum control to make the rotations sort of for uh, less, uh, less uh, sensitive to amplitude uh, in homogeneity. But here, so it, it's enough just to put a very thin wire and the, the, the field is very inhomogeneous, but at the location of one spin, at one angstrom, the gradient is roughly zero. So there is no need for, for complex resonators. So very simple. And uh, this is how, how the signal looks like. So remember, the two spin state now have different brightness. So we focus the light on one of these color centers and uh, we uh, monitor the fluorescence, the number of scattered photons versus microwave frequency. And uh, when we hit a resonance, we get a drop of fluorescence in 30%. So this, in order to get this picture, you need a few seconds time. So it's very simple and very sensitive experiments. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, the, the, the ability to manipulate the state now is, uh, is very much related to well-developed technique of magnetic resonance, either electron spin resonance or nuclear spin resonance. So just uh, to show you how the experiment looks like in the, uh, in the lab, so it's very simple. So the, the whole uh, technology of polarization and readout does not require cooling or vacuum. So experiments is essentially confocal microscope equipped with a small microwave line so this is how it looks in the lab. Microscope objective, here we focus laser light. The diamond is glued somewhere here on the sample holder. This is a sample holder. And you have a microwave line here going through this. There's a small wire here placed on top of diamond. On the back side, you have electromagnet used to tune the energy of the spin transitions. So we can tune the, our qubit to desired frequency. We can uh, shine the microwave pulses to rotate the spins and we read out the spins here with the de detectors place it somewhere here collecting the light from the single color center. Now um, how good we can rotate as I say so there is no problem with field and homogeneity experiment is in a sense very clean so we just apply now microwave uh, pulses with uh, varying duration here on the spin transition and record the population, so how the population change uh, between the states. So this is always converted to fluorescence, to photon counts, so because our spin state is resolved by, by looking at the number of scattered photons. So here you have example of uh, Arabi flops of a single color center. So you can now define your pi pass, we invert the population of pi half pass, making something very similar to Hadamard gate. And you can do it pretty fast, actually. So this particular picture shows you that you can do rotation within 50 nanoseconds, but if you put a smaller wire and put more power, because our, our wire can be very close to NV center, to, to this electron spin, um, we can reach frequency up to uh, hundreds of megahertz or even gigahertz. So this is a plot showing uh, um, David Avshalom group results where he reached, uh, so this is now Rabi frequency versus microwave power. And what you see, the last points align at around 500 megahertz. So the full rotation of the spin will be within, uh, uh, within two nanoseconds. But there is some troubles here also, though, because at this uh, high Rabi frequency, rotating wave approximation don't hold. So the evolution of the spin is pretty complex. And uh, here we are working actually uh, on optimum control uh, to, uh, allow, to allow us to uh, control very fast uh, spin rotation without uh, kind of uh, without be disturbed by uh, non-validity of rotating wave approximation. So we do it with crop pulses, which is very similar to grape pulses, which were introduced in the first lecture. 
So it's a, a sort of a more sophisticated control. But this was this picture was shown just with or was recorded just with normal square pulses, a single uh, microwave frequency uh, acting on the system. And uh, now the other uh, question you can ask is, uh, um, what is if what is a good radio frequency and good control speed? You always have to compare it with a coherence time, dephasing time. So the single qubit gate operation on itself is not a figure of merit. It always uh, gate operation uh, versus uh, coherence time. And uh, this coherence time can be uh, remarkably long in diamond, but remember it's a solid state system. So it's not ideal system. No solid is ideal. There is always defect. And uh, defect form a spin bus. Yeah? So I have to say the phonon don't play so much role uh, in, a, in a up to a 10 millisecond scale in diamond at room temperature. So in the beginning, uh, uh, people observe it much shorter coherence time for this uh, NV center spin. And this decoherence was, was attributed and, and correctly attributed to a spin bus to some other electron and nuclear spins present in a diamond lattice. Yeah, so if you have your central spin, now red this spin is NV center, you might have some other electron spin somewhere in the lattice making a magnetic noise or nuclear spin, for example, associated with this carbon-13, which we know how to remove nowadays. Yeah, but but these uh, two spin bus types, so electron spin bus and nuclear spin bus, are, are making magnetic noise on the qubit and qubit start to deface. So we we just looked whether it's uh, true whether, for example, this carbon-13 nuclear spin bus is crucial. So here is a Ramsey fringes on a, on a single electron spin recorded for different materials where concentration of C13 was varied from a natural 1%. So this is how natural diamonds looks like. So it's a coherence time here. Decay time is in a few microsecond scale. And if you decrease the concentration of this C13 isotope, you get longer and longer coherence time, and actually it goes up to a, up to a millisecond in, in a very, very clean diamond. So for solid state system, is remarkable property that the T2 star time, measured just by Ramsey fringes, uh, can, reach, uh, can reach hundreds of microseconds. Okay. Now, if you're, if you're, um, if you do, don't have a possibility to engineer material to a very high level, and it's not always possible, it's also important to uh, develop active control tool allowing to decouple the electron spin qubits from external noise. So one of the way will be to engineer absolutely pure material. The other is to use control fields to decouple color centers from the spin <coughs> bus, for example. And there are many techniques uh, already developed by magnetic resonance. Um, actually, it's interesting that uh, although the decoupling is a, is, is a very, very old field, so Han Echo, for example, is a, an example which is 60 years old, of CPMG parcel uh, echoes. So this all is, is very, very uh, uh, um, well-known uh, instrumentarium of NMR. A must of NMR sequences were developed to protect uh, some particular state, but not arbitrary state. So for quantum information, is they don't solve all the problems. So there is one of the uh, new important uh, things to develop is to develop uh, protection <coughs> fields which protect arbitrary state. The other is that uh, many ensemble-based uh, uh, NMR experiments were optimized to, to work with ensembles, right? And uh, they all often also operate in a, in a past mode to get a broadband kind of because um, there's some inhomogeneity of in the frequency. So we were thinking about what's actually this is collaboration with Alice Retzker and Martin Plenia whether there's uh, there's other way to uh, to decouple a qubit by using continuous fields without pulsing. So thinking about Hanek, or usually it's several pulses. So whether you can, uh, you can do a similar decoupling just by shining a microwave on, on your qubit in a continuous way. And indeed so, that should work. So if you take a two-level system, which is now a subject of noise, this is one and zero on our electron spin state, the states of the qubit, 
you add your your microwave with uh, with uh, uh, om uh, with some some frequency uh, omega one resonant with the spin transition, and you get now a new state of the system separated now by uh, by a Rabi frequency, right? So the Rabi frequency now uh, so omega zero is now create a new scale on the problem and decouple this the spin create a kind of band gap and decouple the spin from all the fluctuations which which align in spectrum lower in, in frequency than the Rabi frequency. So shining a single frequency on a spin transition decouple it from a, from a slow spin bus, slow enough that it's uh, essentially not exceed the, the Rabi frequency. Yeah? So this is now your, your new uh, protected qubits. However, this, uh, this, uh, this qubit is protected against all the external perturbation except the noise at the Rabi frequency itself. So if I would have a noise here on this field, this separation, energetic separation between plus and minus one uh, or plus and minus eigenstate will start to fluctuate and that will be like efficient, like a decoherence. Okay, so the, the driving of the system is not perfect protection because if the driving fields has a noise component on itself, it can uh, cause decoherence. But now there is a way to uh, illuminate it by applying a second drive. So the second drive exactly at the alarm or fre well, Arabi frequency of the first field, and this second drive will protect uh, the uh, fluctuations on the power of the first field. And the second drive uh, can be much weaker than the first one, and by sort of that means that the noise on the second drive will be much weaker too. So the coherence time of this double dressed qubit will be longer. And you can extend this technique to, to larger and larger number of driving fields. Okay, so this is the idea. And uh, just show you the results. So this is how the coherence of a simply dri driven qubit happens. So the Rabi flops which you uh, detect on a single electron spin. So you don't see so much Rabi flops here because there are many. But uh, so there are a few hundreds here in the interval of a couple of microseconds. But what you see that the amplitude, so there's a very densely placed. But what you see is that the amplitude of Rabi flops decreases. And this decrease is not because of decoherence, really of coming to spin bus. The system is now decoupled from spin bus, but it's coming from a fluctuation of the power of the uh, microwave fields. So every microwave amplifier has some power drifts, and that's if you average your data for a long time, you get this, this picture, right? Now, we check the concept with a second driving field, which is weaker and only devoted to, uh, to remove the fluctuations or to, to decouple the fluctuations of this first driving field helps. So this is now double driven qubit. The second microwave drive is, is, is detuned by a, a Larmor frequency. And what you see here, so this complex picture is related to the fact that we have double driven qubit. But what's important here, you see that the, the Rabi flops extend for much, much longer time. And uh, in our experiments, we were able to detect tens of thousands of Rabi flops before decoherence happens. And uh, so if you think about now fidelity of a single qubit gate in this situation, so fidelity come to 10 to the, so the error rate come to the 10 to the minus 4. And it's very important because uh, um, it's uh, for, for several tasks, like for example for error correction, it's very important to reach uh, high enough fidelity. And even on a single qubit uh, gate level, reaching fidelity of 10 to the minus, so error rates of 10 to the minus 3 and better is often non-trivial. And it's not trivial not because of quantum technology is not good. It's a classical technology which is a problem. Technology which is uh, uh, behind a microwave amplifier source where the power fluctuates by 1%. In many, many applications is not important, but in, so quantum technology rely on a very high fidelity of the gate. And if the power of amplifier is not constant, this pose a problem, okay? And now with uh, the second order drive, we can solve the problem and reach a single qubit fidelity uh, on a 99.99% level. Now, 
This is about one qubit, but uh, of course the interesting uh, story is to couple more than one spin, maybe to couple this electron spin to nuclear spin and, and, and scale up the system. So that's a, a vision how this uh, diamond spins can be uh, scaled up in a combined a EPR, electron spin, nuclear spin resonance um, quantum register. So what you see here is uh, the array of electron spins. These black circles are electron spins. Uh, so coupled between each other by a magnetic dipole-dipole interaction. And uh, ideally, we would like to also protect the information uh, encoded in an electron spin, even in a longer time scale, maybe longer than a millisecond, so we can place some nuclear spin close to the electron spin and use a hyperfine interaction between nuclear spin and electron spin to swap the information from every electron spin qubit at a given moment to nuclear spin, which will allow even longer storage time. So the, the interaction between uh, electron spin will be then dipole-dipole interaction, interaction between nuclear spins and electron spin is also dipole-dipole interaction, so hyperfine coupling in this case. And the question is, how far we can place uh, electron spins and still have enough coupling. So this is now two electron spins. So how, to how far this uh, two electron spin can, can uh, be in order to fill each other still. And uh, so the, the, the answer is, so the, the, gate ra the gate time should be within uh, decoherence time. So it should be shorter than the decoherence time. If you place here a coherence time at, of millisecond as a, as a benchmark, then the distance should be smaller than 50 nanometers. Okay, smaller than 50 nanometers. So at 50 nanometers, the coupling will be on the order of 100 hertz. So in, if at uh, 10 nanometers, for example, the coupling will be on about 150 kilohertz, right? So, but, so 150 kilohertz is perfect, is very good. So it's much, much shorter gates than coherence time. So 50 nanometer is just in the border. Yeah? The gates are pretty slow, but still within a, within a coherence time. Now, can we create these uh, defects with such precision? So 50 nanometer looks to be, I mean, it's, uh, it's a very relatively small scale. So there are technologies nowadays uh, developed by uh, non many needs of nanofabrication or pushed by nanofabrication needs, for example, by semiconductor industry allowing to dope the defects with very high accuracy. So you can either use uh, uh, classic, so very conventional ion implantation, focus at ion beam, <coughs> and implant uh, NV center one spot after another, creating such a, such a, such a grating that uh, we tried already quite a long time ago. And, but the distance here, what technology allow you is maybe a few microns, so it's hard to get better. So they hard to focus these ions in a very, very controlled way, especially for nitrogen ions. For gallium, you can do a better job, but for nitrogen ions, which we need for in V-center, it's very difficult to focus very, very, very precisely. But what we can do is you can take an atomic force microscope with a cantilever having a hole, and then shoot the ions through the hole, and uh, then create an array which uh, have much better control our separation. Here the scale is already a micron, right? And uh, so as you see that you can uh, create arrays of, uh, of NV center with uh, much better than micron precision. Yeah. Uh, I have to say that this technology is actually is, uh, developed in collaboration with a group in Jan Mayer in Bochum and uh, uh, Ferdinand schmidt kaller and we are even trying to uh, place a single ion trap behind this cantilever and shoot single cold ions through the cantilever, allowing even better resolution. So this is under development. We don't have yet results, but this, uh, the project is basically have an ion trap here and uh, deterministically uh, release uh, cold uh, nitrogen ions from the ion trap. And uh, the third possibility is maybe is to scale up in a more efficient way and create arrays of uh, NV centers uh, faster is to use a mask like a polymer mask with many, many holes and, uh, and uh, implant in parallel, and here you see cr uh, arrays of tens of thousands of NV centers created in on demand in particular location. So you can think about this as a, as a 
is that now, for example, optical lattice, so similar, similar architecture, so you have couplings, now it's magnetic couplings, actually dipole-dipole couplings, a bit different mechanism, but in optical lattice, but uh, so picture looks to be very similar, but we have a single site resolution here, but in this particular picture, single site resolution is because two NVs are separated by a micron, and we want to bring them to 50 nanometers. So how to do it? So there is some limits in optical microscopy. You cannot usually focus light uh, to, uh, to, to areas smaller than lambda, uh, so optical wavelengths are two, so uh, 300 nanometers is more or less the limit which uh, ABBA criterion, uh, diffraction uh, criterion uh, give you. But the question is whether uh, we can do better. And uh, there was a, uh, actually quite a development recently in optical technique to get an optical resolution better than a, better than a diffraction limit. So let me explain you very shortly how uh, this technique looks. So we actually uh, make a, a, a beam profile which have a minimum in the center. So it's the cross section of the beam. So this is uh, the green line. So your cross section of the laser beam having a minimum in the center and if you drive the system very strongly in a saturation, so two, then a two-level system don't respond anymore. You reach a saturation of excited states, so around the maxima of the excitation beam, so the fluorescence response will have a very sharp minima in the center, and this minima will be, uh, the sharpness of this minima will be only limited by available laser power, not anymore by diffraction. And so if you scan this donut laser beam, of a color center and look now on optical response. This is what you get as a picture. Uh, so the uh, the resolution not anymore lambda half, but lambda of a uh, Rabi frequency of the optical field. So if your Rabi frequency of the optical field is very high, you can uh, reach any resolution. So in this picture, the optical resolution is 12 nanometers. Okay, so now you can apply this and, and resolve this uh, the color centers, which are very, very close, so even by 10 nanometers, uh, separate it and address them individually. Uh, so the, this is now picture of the clusters of NV centers uh, recorded with usual microscope. So the, the scale here, I'm sure it's not very well visible, the scale here is about three microns. So those are the spots containing many, many color centers. Every spot is about 10 color centers, 10 electron spins. And you, normal microscope cannot resolve them. But if you apply this, uh, super resolution microscopy technique called STAT, stimulated emission depletion microscopy, so this kind of saturation microscopy. Then you can zoom out and resolve individual spins separated by a few tens of nanometers. And now uh, you can look on the magnetic interaction. I go very, very quickly through this slide. So there's uh, the spots having in V-center have now four EPR lines because every color center is spin one. You can separate them by applying a field gradient or tuning magnetic field, right, that every color center has its own microwave frequency. And now by just applying microwave and exploring dipole-dipole coupling, very similar as NMR, you can create entangled state between, uh, between uh, color centers. There is uh, uh, not so much to say about. So if the strong sense of coupling is good enough, you can create entanglement state, entangled state. This is a density matrix tomography of, uh, of two in V centers here separated by about 20 nanometers. Uh, the, uh, it's a, the, every in V center is a Q treat. That's why, uh, so this density matrix tomography is, uh, is a bit uh, larger than for a qubit. What we see is the off diagonal elements have a, uh, have a sort of a, uh, high enough or uh, a large enough to claim that there is entanglement between these two engineered color centers. And uh, moreover, the, uh, the, the uh, entanglement can be swapped to the nuclear spin, reaching fidelity or t, t, time, t two times for entangled state on the order of milliseconds. Yeah? Yes. In this particular uh, case, uh, the, the fidelity of uh, entanglement was uh, on the order of 60, 60 to 70 percent. Yeah, so the fidelity overall is uh, so around 70, 60 to 70 percent, depending on the state. But we do, essentially, we do a, a single qubit gate, like Hadamard gates, and just evolution time, 
and, and the last is a swap to the nuclear spins to, to extend. So the error per gate is about two um, The error per gate, so the, the mass of the errors in this particular case was a two qubit gate, not single qubit gate. Single qubit gate were about 99%, so but it Yeah, and then about 20% error rate on the two qubit gate. But now we got it, the result much better. Actually, now we expect on the very recently we were able to uh, create a pair of NV center which uh, has much better parameters for two qubit gate. So we, we think that we should be able to uh, do the, the same type of experiments reaching fidelity, maybe so about 99.7%. So we have to also make our single qubit gate right. So it's not only two qubit gate. And here, this uh, de decoupling and uh, uh, double resonance drive are very important. Uh, OK, so now, so how to scale up? So you can think about uh, uh, making more and more color centers. And uh, 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 so implanting larger arrays. You can also think about uh, more. Uh, hybrid system approach where you, for example, take a diamond and put some dense lattice of nuclear spin. That can be, for example, graphene. You can think about taking, making a graphene out, out of C30 nuclear spin, placing them onto diamond and use it as a large-scale quantum simulator where your NV center, it's sort of just a readout channel and also polarization channel for graphene. But graphene is a super large molecule for, like, for NMR. You can think about like a NMR based quantum simulator uh, with a readout channel uh, based on the NV center. So NV center will now kind of allow you to polarize fully uh, nuclear spin and read them out. So polarization can be actually done by bringing these two systems into resonance using a, a, a polarization transfer uh, approaches. So I'll just show you uh, shortly how it works. So we, we tested whether we can polarize nuclear spin well, f using NV center, and uh, and usually the, the the difficulty is uh, in transfer of polarization is the energy mismatch. So we can polarize the electron spin very well, but the electron spin have a, a frequency of gigahertz, and nuclear spin is a megahertz. So there are big frequency mismatch. So these two systems don't talk to each other. But you can think about uh, sort of uh, uh, bringing a new energy scale in the problem by driving the by driving the uh, electron spin, and if the Rabi frequency of the, of the electron spin exactly matches Larmor frequency of the nuclear spin, then you have a so-called Hartmann-Hahn condition, where these two qubits now have an energy resonance, and now they start to talk to each other. So we, <coughs> we tested this now on a single spin. So the technique is known for years. But we tested this whether we can use this with uh, with uh, uh, NV centers and nuclear spins, what's important would be to polarize this external graphene sheets or whatever. So we, we tested it inside of diamond having many carbon-13 spins and looked on the line width of the spin transition when we did this Hartmann-Hahn polarization transfer. So the, with unpolarized spin bars, every of these C13 nuclear spin create a, a kind of fluctuating magnetic fields. So, and that results in relatively broad spectral lines. What you see here is the spectral lines of the electron spin. And the blue is before polarization. And then we put the uh, polarization transfer protocol for a few milliseconds. And what you see is that the EPR lines of the, of the electron spin are getting sharper and sharper. And so we, we were able to transfer polarization fully to hundreds of nuclear spins around. And that can be an important step also towards perhaps further, further cooling of nuclear spin using algorithmic cooling, but this is just the initial step, and that showed that polarization of all this nuclear spin is very efficient, and it's also very fast, I have to say, because electron spin can be reset within <coughs> milliseconds, or even faster. So the, the optical channel allowed to, to pump out entropy very efficiently from the system, and it can be cooled to very, very low temperature. Okay. So now, <coughs> in the last few minutes, I don't think I have so much. Uh, so how much I do I have? Five. Five. Okay. Five. Thanks. So I will just uh, show you a few results on uh, on applications of uh, NV centers as a, as a sensor. It might take us some time actually to scale up quantum register to 20, 30 qubits, and it would be actually important to uh, to make something useful using one, two, three, or maybe five qubits. 
So maybe those uh, quantum registers with uh, one, two qubits are not very good processors because they're still slower than the classical computers, but they can be used as a sensors. In particular, if your qubits is very small, atomic scale system can measure fields at the nanoscale, and that's also important application. So uh, let me uh, kind of uh, comment on this and show you a few results, uh, how to use these color centers as a sensors. And maybe uh, let me come back to NMR and uh, application of NMR as MRI. Yeah? So uh, classical NMR brought MRI on market, and MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, is actually a very powerful imaging technique. So uh, MRI machines can deliver very informative pictures uh, showing chemical compositions, dynamics, uh, but usually on a millimeter or maybe 100 micrometer scale. And that's again uh, related to the fact that uh, um, sensitivity of MRI uh, is, is, is limited by to, to some volume of nuclear spin. So this uh, resolution on this picture is nothing to do with wavelengths. Wavelengths of radio waves are a few meters. It's, it's kind of spectroscopic technique already making super resolution here. But sensitivity is low because of our low sensitivity of readout. It would be nice, actually, to make the MRI image on a single molecule. But that's very difficult, again, because of the uh, low sensitivity uh, for conventional machines. But actually, uh, uh, low sensitivity is also related to low polarization, by the way. But uh, uh, already uh, in, a, in, a, in the beginning of uh, NMR era, the way idea is actually how to increase the sensitivity by looking not on a cl uh, classical signal, like looking on the polarization of nuclear spin, but looking on the fluctuations of the nuclear spin's number, in a, uh, fluctuations of polarization. So it was actually proposed by, uh, by Felix Bloch in 1946 that for small ensemble of nuclear spin, fluctuations are larger than the polarization signal. Yeah, so if you have a three nuclear spin, uh, or four nuclear spin, right, so the, there will be fluctuation on the order of square root of n, so square root of four, two nuclear spin will always fluctuate and create actually very, very strong polarization on a, on a short time scale, of polarization fluctuations. So those are larger than the sort of uh, thermal polarization. So if you can detect this very small number of nuclear spin, you can, uh, you can work like with a fully polarized spin ensemble. And uh, uh, so the, the idea here is actually look uh, on, a, on a magnetic noise created by nuclear spin rather than uh, on a, on a, on a polariz polarized kind of induction signal. Uh, so the, uh, the idea here, so we, we, we followed this and wanted to uh, do this using an electron spin as a magnetometer, for, as a detector of the, of the few nuclear spin. We put it and we center now just one to three nanometers close to the surface and looked at the magnetic noise coming from the hyd uh, hydrogen nuclear spins. So we, we were using some pulsing technique to tune our uh, NV center and, and, and look the magnetic noise signature in decoherence. So this is kind of CPMG-like sequences. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but just showing you the results. So when we scanned our sensor, uh, frequency response, our, our LAMA frequency, we get a response of about 2.5 megahertz. That's where the hydrogen LAMA was, and uh, uh, that shows you capability of technique. By the way, the, this signal is coming now from approximately 400 nuclear spin, located in, the, in about 5 cubic nanometers. Okay, so it's a very sensitive NMR, 400 uh, hydrogen spins, without any polarization, zero magnetic field, or very low magnetic fields. No, very low, not zero, but a couple of hundred Gauss. Now, uh, the, um, the question is whether may, perhaps you can even detect a single nuclear spin in this case. So we just very shortly showing you how to, uh, to do it. So we, we actually diluted the, the, the nuclear spin on the top. And uh, uh, by pl pl placing a, a silicon uh, uh, layer, and silicon have a very small number of nuclear spin. Actually, oxygen don't have nuclear spin at all, and silicon have silicon 29 mostly. And what you see here are the pictures of, uh, of about two to four nuclear spin signal of silicon 29. So the, this place in this NV center, very close to the surface, just one nanometer, allow you to sense now uh, external nuclear spin and make an NMR uh, uh, on a nanoscale 
with very high sensitivity. So that can be application actually over, over so this kind of over qubit. So qubit now is a magnetometer, and now what was the problem before, a decoherence, uh, usually you find a decoherence, but if decoherence is coming from a bus uh, at particular frequency, you can now study this bus, and this bus, this particular frequency can be very informative because this frequency is a sort of NMR signal. So let's turn in the problem a bit the way around. And uh, very shortly maybe, <coughs> so nowadays uh, uh, these experiments can be also transferred to using nano diamonds even to living cells, so we can by radiating, that was a sort of first picture I showed you, in milling we can create a solution of very small diamond particles which are just two nanometers or so and bring these whole experiments inside of living cells. So potentially in the future, so since you don't need a cryogenic environment in vacuum, you can perform the same experiments in the very small diamond particles which are like here inside of the cells, inside of cells and looking on individual protein, make an MRI on individual molecules. Okay, so here I just stop and maybe just uh, shortly conclude. So the, uh, our, the, the talk, uh, I hope, was uh, uh, kind of highlighting a few, uh, a few developments which allow you to engineer a system of a solid state qubits and controlling them. So the decoupling and active control techniques are very, very crucial. And so the, I think the next step sort of uh, will be a scale enough which can have a uh, very different realization, either uh, basically implanting and engineering things inside of diamond, but maybe also combining the system outside of diamond and uh, with uh, essentially classical NMR approaches, now using a, a very cold uh, single electron spin for readout and polarization transfer. And the other thing is that uh, essentially uh, the uh, active control uh, of very good readout uh, technology of a single electron spin can be used for sensing. Example was sensing uh, magnetic fields at nanoscale, but it also can be electric fields, temperature, pressure. So whatever is uh, affecting your Hamiltonian and creating some observable signal can be now sensed in a, in a nanoscale. And finally, uh, I think just to say that uh, uh, um, and NMR is very good uh, s sensing technique. So essentially, it's not destructive. So if you, you usually is. Uh, if you want to image your sample in electron microscope, you put it in vacuum and shoot high energy electrons. Usually you, you destroy the sample. So for example, proteins. So for, for biological imaging, is, is, is there, there is a need <coughs> actually for, for having, a, for having a, a sensing which is uh, operate with low energy pho photons. So NMR photons are low energy. Moreover, this kind of sensing, so if you think about it, image, uh, making a 2D, 2D MRI or NMR on a single molecules, might allow you to measure effects which we are not, <coughs> we are able, not able to observe before. <coughs> for example, this electron spin can measure uh, quantum coherence occurring, for example, in biological systems. And uh, the, the fact that this is, uh, these effects are not known yet uh, or not fully experimentally proven yet uh, does not mean that they not, don't exist, or it means that maybe that there is no tool to detect them. So having this nanoscale sensor might allow to, you to, to develop tools to detect uh, quantum coherence in, in, a, in, a, in a biomolecule.